Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa Aparuta de Sangamatasa Tawara e Sodavanta Bamunchan to Satang. This is kind of a metaphysical question. <laughs> Are we living in a purposeful universe? And is it an intelligent universe? I don't know what the purpose of it is, actually. (laughs) 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 But it's intelligent. (laughs) (laughs) You know, on a thinking level, it doesn't seem to have any purpose to it. But then maybe that, you know, that kind of thinking process is limited. So it's, you know, worldly things. We have purposes for worldly aims and values, you know, like to succeed or to develop or, or uh, win or whatever. There's a purpose to make life better or a better society. But on a universal scale, What is the purpose of it? And then the Christian, and then they think God got lonely, so he created. <laughs> That's one way of looking. <laughs> but if God was really God, could God get lonely? <laughs> 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 and then would he create such a universe, you know, just to ease his loneliness and make us all suffer for it? <laughs> 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 think about that too much. <laughs> it is intelligent, and uh, we're part of that. You know, that's what, you know, we're not intelligent. You know, we can be ignorant, but we, you know, we have, we can, uh, you know, develop language and reason, logic, and <coughs> manipulate the conditioned world with science. But then in the uh, ultimate, it's the uh, wisdom, isn't it? That is our refuge rather than just human intelligence is not a refuge. <coughs> I mean, without wisdom, look what we're doing. You know, we're clever with the uh, intellect, you see, that we're destroying ourselves with our manipulations of the conditioned realm because there's not, there's no wisdom aligned to it. So what do you, your, this is, this is my reflection in it. So when you, on this kind of practice, you're, you're, not to develop more intelligence on an intellectual level, but wisdom. And then wisdom is the discerning, and and then the simplicity of the discernment is the condition unconditioned. So that within the boundaries limitations of human incarnation, we we learn this. We get it. We, by letting go of ignorance, then we, then there's wisdom, which is intelligence. But when you try to figure out, well, is the universe wise, or is there a God, or something that's, then you get back into the thinking mind again. So, this is you know, you can't you go around in circles with that. So it's in the Buddhist, you know, 
the reason why, you know, people oftentimes uh, wonder why Buddha didn't develop a kind of metaphysical doctrine like most religions. And, uh, you know, so then, the, and I have questioned this myself, because <coughs> but then it ends up as speculation. And then, uh, so that the Buddha pointed the way of non-suffering, which is rea- realizable and can be, you can prove to yourself, you can recognize and discern as an individual human being. And if you appreciate that, then the metaphysical uh, is no longer, uh, you know, you no longer need to speculate about the ultimate purpose or the, you know, the, the overall plan. Because uh, the, the problem disappears when you let go. <laughs> Could you teach us the who am I method, please? This is from the Ramana Maharishi. So this is, uh, who am I is a method that uh, this uh, Hindu saint, Ramana Maharishi, used. And of course this is this is an expedient means for observing and, and reflecting. <coughs> so you're not trying to, you know, the question is <coughs> is more rhetorical. You're not trying to, you know, find out who you are. But, uh, you know, in terms of personality, I am Ajahn Sumato and so forth. <laughs> <coughs> So I know that. I should I ask who am I? I know the conventional personality, but but this is a uh, a way of uh, listening, you know, to y- taking these three words in a question form. Point is not to find an answer to the question, some kind of ultimate, you know, word and a description of yourself, but to investigate. This is like reflecting using the intuitive intelligence rather than uh, trying to find some intellectual, clever intellectual answer. So like, you know, am I the ultimate reality or... It sounds a bit ridiculous, Um, you know, in in that form. That's why I'm pointing to the, the language itself is a limited function of the mind. So if you're just trying to work on the level of the intellect, then it it is, uh, you know, you just go around in circles. Because that's, you know, the the thinking mind can only go so far and then it, it, it does, it gets in the way. And that's where the mindfulness, uh, intuitive awareness, is a, isn't thinking. It doesn't uh, destroy thought, but it doesn't depend on thought either. So like in discerning, you know, you, you need not think, but you can certainly discern. It's like, like this in this room, <coughs> you know, when you're talking about form and space. I don't need to describe, you know, like form is, you know, it has infinite variety. So in just in this one room, there's, a, there's all kinds of forms in here. So I'm not, we're not, you know, we're not thinking about forms as in terms of qualities, but just recognizing the relationship of form and space. It's discerning, isn't it? You don't have to think about it, but it's this way, discerning, just noticing through through the eye, you know, you can see space and form. And then the, the space, the forms are in the space, 
And so this is what what we mean by discernment. We're not we're not intellectualizing about space being better than form or vice versa. Then we get back into the thinking mind again. I think space is superior to form. <laughs> I'm a spaceman. <laughs> <laughs> but who am I? Then notice, like, like when you ask yourself that question, you know, it's a question for. And what is a when you when you think? Now you're not. It's not a a, a question. It's like a rhetorical <laughs> question. So you're you're not. Uh, so you know you're not asking yourself because you don't know who you are. You know, on a conventional level, we know we have passports. We have. Uh, <laughs> we'll soon have ID cards. <laughs> and uh, and you know, I just need to look up myself up on the internet. <laughs> but who am I? Is when now think that to yourself, but listen to yourself, thinking. And it was like a question. <coughs> There's a gap there, and it leaves a a space. So the it, it, the form and the space. The words are the form. The question, the the grammatical <coughs> form of a question, stops the proliferating mind for a moment. And that's why, where you know, like koans or <coughs> self-inquiry, these techniques that different teachers use. You know, it's <coughs> it's not an intellectual exercise at all, but it's it's a it's a expedient means of of discerning. Because, uh, say, the ignorant, unawakened human being. <coughs> doesn't really discern very much, you know, they just, you just get think, 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 one thought goes on to the next to say, who am I? I'm Ajahn Tomato, who are you? And you give your name. <laughs> and we operate on, on just the, the momentum of, of going from one thing to the next. You know, so, it, you know, we can live in a world, a totally deluded world uh, of distorted perceptions. You know, the w and and or just conditioning is different. You know how different culture groups or tribes or ethnic groups or civilizations—they all have their their values and their you know s ways of of perceiving experience. But we're not interested in all the differences or which one is superior and inferior. But just noticing, discerning. Now this relationship of space to form, condition, uncondition. This is these are the words, but they they that that is the pattern or the paradigm for discernment, like you space to form, consciousness to thought and feeling, consciousness is like space and it has no boundary. It's here and now. Like space is here and now. But you you know, how many of you discern consciousness or your whole experience of life is through forms that you create into consciousness. So it's the same thing as if you come into this room and you just say, Look at look at the nuns, look at the monks, look at the shrine, look at the curtains. That picture over there. What does that mean? That Chinese thing over there. And what? <laughs> what kind of tree is that over there? And why did you paint the wall green? And the <laughs> <laughs> and and then you go and you sit and you think, what should I do next? Should I practice metta or <laughs> do anapanasati or? 
and so we you know we can we can be in the space and never discern it because we, you know we're caught up in the because we're conditioned for the conditioning is we're not conditioned to discern we're conditioned to think and to like and dislike and have values and and uh, hold opinions so uh, so that is that's the conditioning for so say in in uh, investigating this you know like the Buddha said self and non-self anatta and atta atta is Pali word for self means this kind of I am the body I am my emotions <coughs> and anatta well the self the self you know my my sakyaditi my personality it can't conceive of no self. <coughs> it remains an abstract abstraction, some some maybe esoteric reality that only arahants can ever realize. So you, you know you can you can make it a kind of abstract ideal, no anatta. <coughs> but what it, then it's like to discern atta from anatta now, not to to speculate about what anatta is <coughs> because when you try to figure out anatta the the thinking mind is about atta about self about sakyaditi about culture about values and principles and standards and right and wrong and good and bad so they're good people bad people Right people who are right, people who are wrong. They're men, the women, and on and on like this. So, th- this uh, this is the the world of forms. But beyond those forms, beyond the thoughts, what is what is what is uh, like space and the forms in this room? Thoughts arise out of what and cease so this kind of questioning is 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 investigative you know so you're, you're contemplating you're you're beginning to notice uh, maybe <coughs> observe in a way that you never ever thought of uh, of observing before so that's where, like, who am I? It stops the forms from arising for a moment. You notice there's a there's a space with no thought. So thought is like this, and no thought is this. It's discerning, no thought, no thinking, and thinking. So then. Uh, so then, uh, consciousness is consciousness, which has, which is like space. You know, has it's infinite. It has no boundary. No thought has no boundary. Thoughts arise and cease in that emptiness. You know, the, the thoughts arise and cease. They come and go. Who? It just, you know, where did it go? Where did who go? <laughs> <laughs> it ceased though, didn't it? <laughs> so, I mean, c- contemplating this way, you begin to, you know, d- you're you're discerning. You're you're not trying. To it's not thinking anymore, but discerning. Now we don't. W- most most people don't notice. Don't pay attention to the unconditioned, and yet it's here and now. It's real. It's not. It's not an abstract idea or metaphysical theory. Just like space is here and now. It's not. 
I'm not creating it. I don't have to go out to this room to look for space, do I? Let the, you know, wide open spaces maybe. There's not enough space here in England. Let's go to uh, Siberia. <laughs> There's a lot of space there. <laughs> but <laughs> you don't need that much space to discern. Then they uh, say, uh, grasping and non-grasping. You know, as you're in investigating the like of the Four Noble Truths, the grasping of desire and non-grasping. So you, you're discerning the difference. Like grasping is like this, non-grasping is this. But we never notice that, you know, we don't, I'm really attached to this clock, you know. I've got an obsession around this clock and I'm really attached to it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I go back to my kuti and I think, I'm really attached to that clock. <laughs> I haven't noticed that I've, <laughs> there's not attachment at that moment, but I've got this idea that I'm, you know, I have this attachment problem all the time, but you notice that, that when there is, it's like this. When it, when it, there isn't, it's like this. So that's where, you know, like attachment, clinging to desire, this dana upadana, in Pali, this uh, sequence of, of um, avicca, ignorance of the Dhamma, and then dunha or desire, and upadana clinging to desire. So, and then the, what we call paticca samupada. If you investigate that, it it start it traces this how the with avicca is the you know affects you know the 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 body and the and the mental state. So you know avicca affects the sankharas, which affect consciousness. So when there's a vicha, then our consciousness is, is, is you know, we're, we're, we're starting with a vicha, we, from habit, from ignorance, then we, then everything that we think and, and, and uh, experience is, is through the, through a vicha, through ignorance. So we end up with suffering or dukkha. So on that Paticca Samupada teaching, you know, it goes, they reaches, it always ends with dukkha as the result of a vicha. Now this isn't to be seen as some kind of Buddhist doctrine, but, it, you know, it, it's about here and now, and it's about, you know, that these are for reflecting on the teachings for discerning, you know, helping you to to really notice, like like who, like attachment and non-attachment. How do you how do you uh, how do you discern attachment? Well, this is you know like just say <coughs> de desire, dana, ubadana arise. So say in in experience, say um, uh, desire for. Um, <coughs> Or something, you know, desire for some kind, of like a. I'm afraid of talking about food because then you'll think I really desire it. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned my lesson. <laughs> <laughs> and I get inundated with that for a while. <laughs> so, <laughs> may I. I want <laughs> say I want a book, a certain book, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I'm sitting here and I think, and the and the the percept this book comes into my car, and then and then I'm I'm not being aware, I'm not discerning anything, I'm just caught in the 
Anyway, this book that I've always wanted, suddenly I'm sitting here and the name of this book arises. I think I've got to have that book. <laughs> so I start following it, you know, uh, uh, I, you know, I get, I get, the, you know, how am I going to get this book, you know, no, I'm <laughs> don't have any money. <laughs> 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 and good bhikkhus don't drop hints and that kind of. <coughs> <coughs> now you kind of, you know, you kind of get caught into it, attachment. So, so like the, if you're discerning, then, then say, sitting here in the, and the, image of this book arises, you're aware of it arising. And of uh, maybe an interest, like the, maybe the dunha is more like interest is this kind of longing or, you know, holding there because uh, this is the book you want. And then I become, I attach to that desire, then I get caught up in trying to figure out how to, how I can get it. You know, that's the observing uh, how dhanha and dhanha ubadhana, and then ubadhana um, bhava. You 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 become, you know, through ubadhana you become uh, obsessed with this someone. You become somebody who is, you know, figuring out how I can get what I want. And then, uh, and then I, you know, I'm becoming like this, and then I'm more interested where this is, you know, what I is like a rebirth, jati, and then, then even if I and if I don't get the book, then there's suffering, isn't it? I didn't get what I wanted, or I get the book, and then maybe I don't like it, <laughs> <laughs> disappointment. Or after I've read it, you know, I just put it away or give it away or something. So uh, it's always this sense of of ignorance, uh, not understanding, not discerning, not seeing things as they are, brings forth these 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 desires, the attachment, the becoming, the birth, rebirth, and then the uh, disappointment or the despair or the suffering that comes from that. So, you know, I've explored this many times just to this particular teaching, but teach a samupada. It looks very complicated when you, when you, you know, you look at it in a book. But it, it's, uh, but it actually is very useful for, I- for investigating uh, this the level like dhanha ubadana. So you kind of discern what dhanha is, you know, you get to, you know, you have to accept desire, and you're not trying to, you're not coming from idea desires are bad, and I shouldn't have any desires, and grasping, a good monk shouldn't grasp anything, you're coming in from ideals, that doesn't do it. So that's, that's the formed world again, but... <laughs> You're actually exploring desire, like in the Think Noble Truth, three kinds of desire. They're, they're not like things that we, when we say let go of desire, it's not like because it's bad and, and it's dirty and, and we shouldn't touch it. It's not getting all fussy and idealistic, but it's, you know, it's getting to know desire. This is a desire realm the realm that we're experiencing through this body, you know. So, <coughs> we we investigate, discern desires like this and non-desires like this. So, you, when you, when you, if you don't, at, like if you, if you're attached to a desire and then you let go of it, then you realize non-attachment And then, then you, that's discerning, discerning the, so this is what we call panya. Now, when you let go of everything, it's not an annihilation. 
or an Armageddon or end of the world, uh, uh, you know, end of the universe uh, on a, you know, as annihilation. But it's it's uh, we, uh, we it's a cessation. Desire rises and ceases, and so we, you know, it's not permanent state. So, you know, you you. Desire is no longer a problem once you know it, you and discern it. You know what it feels like when, it, when it's present, when it's absent. That's discerning. It's not judgmental. Then. Um, when self dissolves. Normally, strong fear arises as consciousness like that feels utterly unfamiliar, nothing to latch on to. So, uh, that, you know, that consider that emotionally, emotions are conditioned, they're forms, you know, so, so we're conditioned, you know, out of ignorance, uh, emotionally our habits are around Happiness and suffering. So you know, and and so we we you know emotionally we, you know, like many of us come into meditation. And we what we want from it is to be happy. And have an emotional happiness as a as a continuous experience, to be emotionally happy, all the time. You see, so that's uh, out of ignorance. That's a vicha. <laughs> because this realm is not like that. It's not heaven. So, and so then, the, and then suffering, dukkha, is, is what we dread. You know, what if, what if we don't, I'll never have a happy moment in my life. Life is just such a disappointment and it's all miserable. And, and that's hell, isn't it? That's the hell realm where you just, you know, you just forever and more. There's never going to be happiness because there's no happiness in the world. It's all misery, and that's that's still attachment to forms, isn't it? To views, and that's an extreme. Dukkha is an extreme. Sukha or happiness is an extreme. And emotionally, you know, we're we're conditioned through those experiences. For nibbana, we're not conditioned for that. So when we realize emptiness or non-self, emotionally we can feel very frightened of it. Because it's like you're going to drop into a black hole. You know, it's uh, it's like looking into emptiness. It's, you can't find yourself. You don't know what's going to happen. It's emotionally we can be terrified. So, and that's the, but that's where to to realize, recognize, discern emotions are forms. Uh, and even though they, they're very convincing forms when you're having those emotions, your discerning faculty still, you, you start discerning, observing emotion. You know, so happy, being happy is one, being depressed is another, and then fears and and um, anger and greed and and jealousy and despair and anguish and grief and all well, these these emotional habits or tendencies are you know they arise and cease they're a nietzsche and non self so, but when when one recognize first recognizes or realizes emptiness, emotionally one can be quite frightened by it because um, um, you know, the emotional reaction to it is, is it doesn't know how to, how to deal it's the unknown it's, it, it, it might appear on a, on a personal level like you're going to dissolve into a black hole of nothingness which is a fear of annihilation so don't be deluded, you know, if you experience that, be 
discern fear. Terror is like this. <laughs> <coughs> to let go feels the right way, but there is a massive resistance. How are we? How can we act skillfully here? The experience could be overwhelming. Like letting go and then, you know, the, this is to that resistance to letting go. It, you know, you become aware of that. Like, uh, there's, you know, one does, you know, there's many things we, we, we want to let go of, the bad stuff, the good stuff, we'd like to keep. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so you know, they to get rid of anger and fear and all these, but there's certain very enjoyable, pleasurable experiences in the form of the world, sense realm, you know, that one isn't quite willing to let go of, resistance to it. But you, you start discerning that. It's not, not a matter of making yourself let go of everything. It's some kind of, you know, final act of, sacrifice. <laughs> but, I mean, that's too grand, but you're learning to see the suffering in, in resisting. And, and, and then, if, you know, you, you can assume that letting go is getting rid of things. So, so you, you know, you have to, you know, get rid of your car, your house, your, your, pet dog. You have to get rid of your husband. <laughs> <laughs> you've got to get rid of your children and you've got to get rid of, of uh, the nice furniture and all the rest and, and become a, an ascetic. <laughs> so that's <laughs> That's very idealistic, isn't it? That's taking letting go to as an ideal. But work from the, you know, we're not talking about alt, you know, ideals because they're extremes, but, but observing on just a level at where you are feeling and experiencing right now. Uh, and letting go isn't like we just pushing away or throwing away, but it's, it's relaxing, it's uh, and allowing something to be what it is. To let go of anger means that you you don't resist it anymore. You don't follow it, but y the the feeling still can can uh, still linger in your consciousness. And so then you you're you're discerning it, the feeling, the lingering feeling of of emotional anger is like this. <coughs> and then if you say, I don't want this, then then you then you're back into the form realm. Not wanting something is desire. So maybe an unpleasant uh in the wake of, of an angry uh experience, there's this lingering sense of anger and and that. But a as you discern it, recognize it, you're actually letting go of it by allowing it to be what it is. And then it ceases, you know, as nature is to end, to cease. You're discerning its, its, its absence, non-anger. See, so this, is, this is how to, to, to develop the wisdom. This is a good one. During the evening chanting, why do we rush through the forgiveness practices, acknowledgement of fault, of any wrong action towards the Buddha Dhamma Sangha? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do. <laughs> <laughs>
Now this one is, uh, can you talk perhaps about, a, a bit about mindfulness, awareness between two, three people? It's, it's easy to take mindfulness, awareness of what goes on inside myself, but what about awareness, mindfulness, of the impact one has on the outside, uh, as such as another person and environment? So, this is uh, a rather important question, actually. So, <coughs> because, you know, like you're sitting here and you're you know, you, you know, if, if you say, if I, I, I used to see in my own practice, like, you know, you you have a meeting, and a sangha meeting, and there's all more kind of things brought up, and and in these in these meetings are boring, and people have to each one has to give their opinion about something, and and you think, oh God, when is this going to end? And then. <laughs> And then the meeting ends, and you and I go back to my community and sit in front of the shrine, and I can go quite calm, you know, let and let it all go. But how to do this in the meeting itself <laughs> when you're in the midst of it, and you're having a sangha meeting, <coughs> and uh, and it can get acrimonious or argumentative. And or the you know the is it boring usually, so you <laughs> so you you know you feel you know, when when you know when is it going to end? <laughs> <laughs> and then you think maybe I'll pretend I have to go to the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> So, so then uh, you know, so then it's dukkha, isn't it? Then they. Uh, so this is the challenge, you know, of of you know uh, what I could see was, you know, I I've developed I developed a lot of like peacefulness and tranquility and awareness by turning away from the world and others. But then when I turn around, here you are, you know. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then this is, uh, you know, this is the challenge. How to, how to, where it doesn't make any difference whether I'm facing the Buddha shrine or, or the community. So this is how I've done it, is, <coughs> that's why I, I I like this sound of silence so much because um, you know it's always present. So when I'm looking at the Buddha, sound of silence. When I'm looking at you, sound of silence. And then by by noticing that, you know this what I call sound of silence, this sound stream is always present. You know it doesn't matter whether. I'm facing the shrine or closing my eyes or plugging <coughs> up my ears and trying to shut everything out. Sound of silence is always the same. So whether I'm talking now or or s ge getting bored with a meeting or or turn around at the shrine or whatever, sound of silence is always here and now. Now the mood changes, you know, my I'm bored with this, but sound of silence is is still there, underlying the boredom. And uh, and so then I tune into that. Now that by paying attention to that, then I'm. You know, I can I I'm not making I'm not creating suffering around the boredom, and or the the acrimonious. Uh, words of somebody, or the criticism, maybe somebody's uh, telling me off. 
blaming me for something. You know, so like uh, some one time uh, a member of the community blew up at me and, and started, you know, telling me off. And uh, so I, I thought this is opportunity. So and it was at a morning meeting, you know, everybody was there, and this this guy just uh, really furious and he was saying all these insulting terrible accusations <laughs> and uh, and so I I, I I listened to the sound of silence and then this allowed me to receive his, this this person's uh, anger I could listen so I wasn't shutting anything off you know I wasn't rejecting him or what he was saying. So it wasn't suppressing anything. But I'm fully receptive to the to what he's saying. But I'm I'm stabilized in this stillness. And then I'm also aware because this is a intuitive reality, so it isn't it isn't rejecting anything or, or selecting or choosing. So it includes everything. So my own emotional habits, you know, were also received in the, that come out of this silence, you know, so and, and, and so I could be aware of my indignation, uh, my, you know, th- you know, tendency to want to, you know, assert myself and pull my, pull rank and, and, uh, Tell him he's an ungrateful, ignorant, <laughs> hopeless case. <laughs> uh, but I never spoke on any of this, uh, and I didn't grasp any of it. You know, so this is where I could, you know, I found this way. Uh, then I can, I can, um, you know, receive the the impingement, whether it's peaceful, turn around to the Buddha Rupa, I say. I can't bear this anymore. It's just too much. I'm totally shattered by your harsh criticisms, and I turn around to the Buddha Rupa. <laughs> <laughs> now, to me, the the uh, the the uh, the challenge is how to be in this stillness in the midst of the battlefield. You know, so this this is how just sharing my own experience. I keep trying to encourage people to do this. I don't know whether they're doing it or not, but um, it does work if you, you know, you have to, you have to, you know, re- develop confidence in this sound of silence and and cultivate it so you you really can, you know. It doesn't, you know, it, but if somebody is really angry, you know, it brings up strong emotions in me. If somebody's angry with me, then it brings up anger in me. So that's a very strong kind of overwhelming emotion. So you need to, you know, have more strong strength in the sound of silence. But sound of silence is everywhere. So as you, you know, so it's not just... Uh, to deal with anger, but you know, with the flow of life in the conditioned realm, it's the it's the space and the anger and the, my anger and the other person's anger are the forms that come and go in the space. And so at that point, then I can withdraw my you know interests and and reactions to the forms, but I'm certainly discerning them. You know, they're they are what they are, and whether they're they're my the anger that arises in me or the anger that I'm getting from somebody else, and then the this sound of silence is can can ha- have the room for it all. You know, it's not discriminating. My anger, your anger, the world's anger. <laughs> So, 
So then, uh, you know, you find you then by testing this out, then you you can really, uh, <coughs> you know, it takes, you know, you have to be willing to, you know, to put it into to practice in when you're in the midst of something, like when this this person got angry with me, you know, and it was. You know, at one time I would have been very upset, and and I would have pulled rank, and I said, "This is no way to talk to me." You know, this is disrespectful, and you had better shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and I would, you know, I could. I was a lot bigger than him. I could, I could have, you know, even bullied him a bit. But but this is uh, this is you know this is uh, a way of you know I but I saw it as an opportunity because at one time I wouldn't have been able to handle that situation very well at all and some of the monks were very upset with me they thought I should have put him in his place you know because it upset everybody. You know, a community. One person gets angry, and and it, you know, you it affects everybody. Now, now, in for me, it was a a sense of triumph because I, I you know, I really, you know, felt you know this is possible. I wasn't suppressing, and I was, but I wasn't trying to blame or defend. Or or use my position. I could feel all these tendencies arising. You know, it wasn't that I didn't feel any of these things, or I, you know, I could feel defensive, or I, you know, feel ding, how dare you talk to me like that kind of feeling. And you're only a summoner, there, and I'm a senior monk. <laughs> 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 it's not that I don't have those kind of thoughts, but. But they they aren't important, you know. Their their forms arising, ceasing. In this discerning way, you know, they are what they are. You know, not diminishing the power or the quality of them, but seeing them from a discerning, intuitive discernment, rather than from emotional habits and reactions. Which is all about, you know, getting caught up in, in how dare you talk to me, and and you should shouldn't, you know, and getting and trying to defend myself that I never said that, I never did that. You've got it all wrong. You're the one that's wrong. You've never, you know, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> and then you get an argument. That's what's wrong with the world, isn't it? That's why you know, every, you know, the world is like this because you know it's all it's righteous. I'm right and you're wrong, and you said this and you did that, and uh, you shouldn't have. And then the other person is put on a defensive. Well, you know, you I did that because you did that. <laughs> well, that doesn't get and look at Northern Ireland, you know. Hopeless there, isn't it? Uh, Sinn Fein and the Ulsters. <laughs> they always, uh, you know, you did this, and <coughs> and so there's there's no solution to that. You know, just a matter of probably wearing down to where the only thing left to do is to compromise. Uh, here, uh, dear Ajahn Sumedho, could you speak of metta, please? And so metta is, uh, uh, now that is unconditioned love, loving kindness. Uh, I kind of like unconditioned love. And this is where the English word love is, you know, is a powerful word, actually. But it also is often means liking something. So, you know, it's, it's used for so many different things. And so it means I, I like 
or it can mean an obsession. You know, I've got I, I love you can mean I'm totally besotted and want you for me. <laughs> it isn't on condition, is it? Because if you don't, you know, if you don't love me back, I'm not going to love you anymore. <laughs> Oh. So that, uh, but the, so and so, love is uh, is oftentimes a, uh, you know, a kind of, you know, a, a, a superlative for liking, but in in uh, say in metta, it's like like in the Christians use Christian love or unconditioned love, and and the word itself is, you know, it's a powerful word in English, so it's not to be just dismissed, but but this is where you you learn how to use the words, you know. So you're not just, you know. I love uh, I I love uh, uh, Mexican food. Just love it, you know. And then, but not unconditionally, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what if it's lousy Mexican food? You don't love it. <laughs> so. So that means I like, you know, I prefer or I want. Mm -hmm. Or romantic love is is like being kind of infatuated and besotted and 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 sentimental because romantic love you can't sustain, and and you know it comes and goes. But but unconditioned love is uh, you know you can only re recognize it through awareness. So it's a uh, you know it's it's it because this is this is the uh, underlying the anger and fear and greed and jealousies and problems and confusions grief and despair and all the rest is unconditioned love. Well, then the meta practice is. You know, when you think of metta, then it's it's a willingness to allow something to be what it is. Because usually conditioned love is, I'll love you if you'll change your ways. If you give up smoking and uh, help me do the dishes. <laughs> and... <laughs> And make more money, <laughs> then uh, that will sustain my love. <laughs> yeah. And if you change, you know, I don't like some of your habits. I don't like at all. And and so then, then you know, you, there's always conditions. My love is is conditioned, you know. And they say, I love you no matter what, but please change because. <laughs> 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 But in the in the, but unconditioned love is is isn't it's not asking change or requesting anything. So it doesn't approving or liking. It doesn't mean that you like everybody's habits and you just love everything about them, and and you just want them to be the way they are because you, you know that's that's being very idealistic, because that's not the way it ever is, is it? Because I, you know. If, with another person, isn't it? You, there's always these love-hate kind of problem. You love them and hate them <laughs> in the conditioned way of loving and hating. These are, <laughs> but uh, so because uh, you know, with parents or anybody, you know, there's you, you feel you know, uh, you know, you, this love, and, and, that and, and then something happens and you're angry with them, so you feel you hate them. But underlying all that is unconditioned love. Now this can be recognized because through awareness. So it's unconditioned. Then it's uncondi It's the unconditioned itself. Now this this means like observing you know, the the thinking mind or the way we we you know loving or unconditioned metta towards oneself because when you practice metta you you start with ahang sukito homi may I be well 
so this is this is the 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 form usually the, the formula that we use. So notice that it starts with "May I be well," and this is this is just a suggestion to the mind of of being of not being critical <coughs> because sometimes we we think of ourselves always in in critical ways, you know, self-disparaging uh, habits of, of, you know, dwelling on our weaknesses, faults, flaws, uh, and holding ourselves up to an ideal, you know, of, I wish I were this noble man with, you know, but, and I, I, you know, I wish I were unselfish. Uh, I'd love to be unselfish as an ideal, but sometimes I'm really selfish, and I don't like that. I shouldn't have any selfish thoughts. And so my ideal, my altruism is being unselfish, but then conti- a situation arises, and I, I'm only thinking of myself. And then I, think I shouldn't be like, this is bad. So I try to suppress the selfishness, or I feel guilty about it. I go back and I think, oh, I was really selfish. God, I was selfish. I just thought of myself. I wasn't thinking of the other person at all. Oh, I'm hopeless. Then in in with metta towards yourself, then, you know, having metta for selfishness, for anger and greed, and doesn't mean approving, but it means not not creating aversion, not complicating it with guilt and self-aversion and disparagement and obsession with your faults or despair. Uh, so you, you're more accepting and allowing. So your, your altruistic side of being unselfish is, is a kind of guiding star, you know, it's a beautiful ideal. But then unselfishness, the reality of it only can be realized through recognizing selfishness. Not trying to get rid of it or hate yourself for having it, but recognizing it. And and that recognition then is 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 not making it into a problem, but selfishness is like this. And there's a kind of meta feeling of accepting it, not making it into anything more. It is like this. So, so the loving ki- you say the loving kindness. This is how to say metta for yourself, and then for others, may all beings be well. Is this is you know if you if you if you see it from towards yourself, then then the then also towards others. Not creating uh, pr- proliferating endlessly hating and resenting and criticizing others. <coughs> or if you do, if you're caught up with some obsessive aversion of somebody else, have metta for that. So you actually, you know, you're feeling this anger towards somebody. Your altruistic says you shouldn't. You should have loving kindness for us. But your emotion is He's an ungrateful reprobate, disgusting, <laughs> and I wish he'd go away, get lost, <laughs> go to another monastery. <laughs> 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 and and, and uh, I shouldn't think like that. <laughs> or just by discerning this, this, this anger is like this is a way of of allowing it to be. It's not approving or disproving. It's not on that level, but it's on, it's in the unconditioned, allowing conditions to be what they are. Then people ask me, well, what if, you know, how do we solve the problems of the world? And this is, if, if we see unfairness and injustice and cruelty, should we just say that's the way it is and, and have metta for it? Or, <laughs> well, this, this discerning ability, you know, this, then as you, you know, you're more capable of dealing with particular c- circumstances, 
because of the wisdom faculty. It isn't a passive, you know, it's just all conditions are impermanent and they rise and cease and that's the way it is. <laughs> uh, it might sound like that in the way I'm talking, but it, you know, you you can respond to situations from from mindfulness wisdom rather than just react with with anger and rage and indignation. <laughs>